Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I am going to get to Ephesians, um, but I find it very difficult to listen to that gospel reading and just let it go <laughs> and move on to Ephesians. So I want to give you a moment or two uh, to contemplate uh, the brokenness at the heart of that story uh, in which violence becomes a tool for a tyrant uh, and the ways in which one or two people's desires become fear and violence towards others. And you only have to look at the news today to recognise its relevance. I wonder if I can have some help. Does anyone recognise what this is? Has it? Oh. In some ways, absolutely correct. A test? Where are the Charles of the 80s here? This has a particular name. Well, they're called the magic eye picture. Um, so the idea about a magic eye picture is that there is an image there that is kind of hidden. And the way that you see this image is to look differently to how we normally would. So I have a number of copies of this. And while I'm preaching, I'm hoping some of you will try to have a look and see if you can find the image in it and kind of, you know, I'm sure there'll be a prize for the first person to tell me what image comes out. Would anyone like to give it a go? Okay. Paul writes in um, Ephesians these words, With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. We begin looking into Paul's letter to the Ephesians by wanting to take a look at the idea of mystery. It's partly because sometimes people have referred to this letter to the Ephesians as a little revelation. And we kind of have an idea, you know, revelation, oh, that's a book of scripture, you know. Um, this is a little revelation. And I suppose to begin with, I want to ask the question, well, what does that mean? Because Paul, again and again in this letter, uses the word mystery, revelation, revealed. It seems to be at the heart of what it will mean to understand what is going on in this letter to the Ephesians. I'm doing this in some ways um, to challenge us to wonder about how we you're doing very well so you're first just hang on for a second okay um 
Uh, anyway, no, no, that's, that's, that's just fantastic. I, I want to suggest to you that I want us to see this letter with fresh eyes. Uh, I sometimes say it this way. We seek 20, 2024 answers... I'm going to go back a step. We seem to use 16th century answers for 2024 questions using a first century book. I got it right that time, didn't I? <laughs> and sometimes the filters that have uh, we hear these letters through, I've heard it described as like pouring red wine through a tea bag. It changes the taste. And I think it's really helpful for us to consider how many aspects of what Paul is seeking to say have been shaped by his own world. And let's be very clear. He and his listeners have been shaped in their understanding in words like, uh, chosen, predestined, mystery, <laughs> the, this age and the age to come, by Scripture, the Hebrew Testament. So when they use these words, they are using them in the way that they have come to understand them through the knowledge of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Testament. You know that one we go, I oh, don't really like that Testament, I like the New Testament better. So I could get rid of that Old Testament. We will not understand, we will not have the mystery revealed to us if we do not spend some time understanding what it means through the Hebrew Testament. So that's what I'm hoping we're going to do today. But first, we, we, uh, partly today, over the next seven weeks, partly um, we're going to ask the question about mystery, about uh, the idea of revelation being that which is being unveiled. So we did have, did we have an answer? What, what did, it's Saturn, yeah. So the image uh, that you can see there that comes out in 3D is an image of Saturn, the planet Saturn. Now, I want us to quickly think. Here is a, a picture that if we use with our straightforward eyes, it appears as if there is nothing else there. Uh, but if we follow some instructions, and, and they're kind of like you've got to bring it up to your nose and then you pull it out slowly, and see those two red dots at the top? When it becomes three dots, that's when you hold it still. Now, if you only see two dots, you've got further to go. If you see four dots, then um, you've gone too far. If you see ten dots, uh, I can't help you. Um, so, the thing about that is it talks to us about the idea of mystery unveiled. And perhaps the most significant thing about that, even here, is the thing that is being unveiled was always there. It was always there. It just required the right circumstances for it to be revealed. At the heart of Ephesians is this question of the mystery that is revealed in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A mystery that Paul first encounters on the road to Damascus. A mystery that was unveiled not just in a flash of inspiration, but he went away for two or three years to work it out. <laughs> How might our look at Ephesians help us draw back something more of the mystery of God in Jesus Christ? What will we see? Paul says, with all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. He does this 
as a plan, a plan for the fullness of time. Christ's life is part of a plan that works out for the fullness of time. And that plan is to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. What's the plan? To gather up all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. How's that going to occur? Well, that's the mystery that we're seeking to reveal. Okay? I am... Um, I'm suggesting here that as we go through uh, Ephesians, we'll come across a number of keys for understanding. Uh, terms and ideas that perhaps we have set thoughts about what they mean. You know, things like predestination, things like about what it means to be human, what it means to be chosen. Um, here's my most controversial one that I'm going to let you sit with. Uh, you can even be grumpy with me for a while about. I'm going to suggest to you that in Ephesians, Paul suggests that grace is not unconditional. Yeah, I'm going to leave you with that. Um, I am... Um, uh, the key to that will be the idea of what uh, Paul understands about gift and grace, uh, and we'll get to that. What I want to do today is talk to you about this idea of what it means, when, what Paul means about when he talks about this age and the age to come. Um, I, uh, Lynn made me some really nice circles last night that we used at uh, Resonance, and I can, because I'm on this side, I have no idea which one is which. Um, I need a mirror, but I, I put those circles up on the screen and what I want to do is to try and illustrate to you what I think Paul and his Jewish counterparts understand about the term this age and the age to come. They would have known. It is something that comes to them from their faith from the Hebrew scripture. And I'm kind of asking the question, how does this fit together? Uh, is it one after the other? Are they separate? Are they apart? Are they on top of each other? How does this work? So let me say to you, um, no matter how we have come to understand this ourselves, right or wrong, we're going to start with what I think we can say about how Paul understood it. So, um, it's perhaps helpful if I say uh, when we talk about the age to come, we might talk about that as being the kingdom of heaven, okay? So, uh, Paul speaks about the idea of this age being an age which is characterised by being dominated by principalities and powers, sin and death. That's the experience of this age. The age to come is characterised by uh, a decisive action of God which judges and challenges the principalities and powers and sin and death of this world such that a new age begins which is characterised by God's life and rule. This age and the age to come. So, I think the first thing we have to understand is that in the first century, Jewish people understood it this way. Uh, you might have heard the phrase, uh, the resurrection at the end of the age. I think it appears in John, it's either Mary or Martha. You know, I know he will be raised at the end of the age. Age. It's a reminder to us that people of the first century understood resurrection as a thing that would happen in the future to everybody. 
a thing that would happen to, in the future to everybody. It would happen at a time that God would act decisively to challenge the principalities and powers of this world, to challenge sin and death. And in acting decisively, all that belonged to this age would fade away and the new age would be inaugurated. And it's characterised by the resurrection of all. That's how the Jews understood this term. What happens if that's what you believe and suddenly you're walking down the road and you encounter the resurrected Christ and he's the only one who's been resurrected? And we're just ignoring, is it Matthew, where there's a few hundred more. But anyway, um, in a sense, you, your categories for resurrection have just been blown apart because resurrection occurs to all somewhere in the future. And it's just this guy. What do you do with that? Well, he went away for two years to work it out. I think this is part of the heart of the mystery that Paul says is being revealed. I think generally that describes what a whole bunch of us have thought is the case. This age, ruled by principalities and power, characterised by death. Um, the cross... Uh, at, at which Christ makes it possible for us, and we often talk about a bridge, uh, that belief takes us from this age at our death or when Christ returns to the age to come. But it's hard to know what happens in the middle. Uh, so I want to suggest to you that this is what Paul came to understand. Paul came to understand that if Christ has died and been resurrected, he is the first of the resurrection of all. We sometimes talk about the first fruits. And in being resurrected, the new age has been inaugurated, it's begun even while the old age is still with us. The sense here is that there is a period between Easter and Christ's return where this age, characterised by the principalities and power, sin and death, coexist with the age to come when Christ is on the throne... <laughs> And life is characterised by the kingdom of heaven. So if that's the case, what do we do with that? How does that change how we might need to think about the life that we have? Well, I think Paul goes on in Ephesians to give us an answer. Um, but let me just touch on it now. This is a quote from uh, Hugh Mackay. Some of you will know Hugh Mackay, psychologist, social researcher in Australia, has written lots and lots of books. He's just, this has come from his latest uh, book um, where he reflects on Australia over the last 25 years. He says this, A wounded society can only be healed when enough of us decide to live differently. When enough of us decide to live differently. I want to suggest to you that as we go through Ephesians, words like chosen, predestined, this, the idea of mystery being revealed the idea about grace being unconditioned but not unconditional, all point to the idea that Hugh Mackay gets partly right. A wounded society that resorts to violence can only be healed when enough of us decide to live differently. I wonder when 
Ephesians talks about a plan to draw all things to himself, that a plan means that there might be some of us chosen, predestined, to be those people who need to live, live differently. That, in fact, this image that I give you suggests that as these two things overlap, uh, that we are called to live differently, chosen to live differently, to be those people who by our actions one with another reveal God's kingdom, the age to come. The emphasis is on us together. I know I wrote a bit about that in the focus. The second song we sang today, a lovely song, I'd like to change one word. So it keeps on saying, it's all being prepared so you would come. For you. Can we change it to we? Because I think Ephesians does. I think Ephesians says, this is firstly about God and the praise of God, and we do it together, not individually. Can I suggest to you, sorry, I know I'm getting carried away. Is it all right? That the shooting of the, uh, the attempted shooting of the, president, the previous president of the United States of America this morning, yes, someone shot at Trump, and they, um, uh, is a sign that we need to live differently. I want to suggest to you that in a world that is seeking individualism, that when democracy finds that on the different sides of an argument, one side of the argument, if they think they are going to lose, do not trust if they lose that they will be looked after. We've lost the sense of the building up of community. And I want to suggest to you that is the heart of the gospel that we find in Ephesians that is relevant for the here and now. And it will start with us individually choosing to live a life for one another, to be some people for all people. Uh, some of you might have been hoping I was going to do this whole, oh, well, you know, Ephesus is this geographically and, you know, and Paul was there for a little while and, you know, and all those kind of things that you do. to ensure. You can do it yourself. Um, there is, uh, we have put on our website some information and some short videos that will do all those things for you. Can I encourage you to do that? Can I encourage you to read Ephesians Front to back, it's six chapters, 20 minutes, it'll be okay. <laughs> and start to wonder, is what you're hearing written here consistent with how you understand the mystery found in Christ? And if you're not finding exactly what you expect to find, ask why not? I pray as we seek to be Christ's community in this place, seeking to build one another up in Christ and be a sign of this good news to a broken world, that over the next period of time, this letter will speak to us and reveal the mystery at the heart of God's life and love. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.